Uh, thank you for joining me today to learn a little bit more about Panama. Uh, I'm gonna get started and more people will roll in as we go. Uh, I am keeping everyone on mute right now just for the sake of all of our time. Um, but if you'd like to ask a question throughout the, this webinar, please use the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, you can type in your questions there and I'm gonna save time at the end to address all of those. Uh, and then if people wanna stay on and have a discussion, I'm happy to uh, unmute everyone and then we can just talk back and forth about what we're experiencing and what we're discussing right now. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Kirsten Gardner. I oversee the Central America portfolio with Clark Cotola representation. I'm based in Portland, Oregon, and I'm currently coming to you from my guest bedroom because we're using this time to rip our house apart and work on a lot of home projects. Um, I have a background in history and anthropology and my interest in Latin America really stemmed and my undergraduate studies when I uh, got a certificate of Latin or Amer literature of the Americas, started reading a lot about these destinations. Uh, and then my career, uh, I've been very lucky to work in the tourism industry for almost 15 years. Uh, I started as a travel advisor, a virtuoso travel advisor um, with Frontiers Elegant Journeys in Pittsburgh, moved on to a tour operator role, um, also led some trips and was a, was a naturalist guide and now work in marketing and sales, so have come full circle. A majority of that time in my career was focused on, uh, on South and Central America. So very lucky to be living my passion like, like most of you. Um, and today we are talking about Panama. Apologies if some of this is redundant for a lot of you. I know many people on this are going to be, have more experience and expertise in Central America and Panama than I do. Uh, but just for a quick geographic orientation, uh, Panama is really the central connection point between North and South America. It's bordered by Costa Rica on one end and then to the, you could say it's the Southern border is with Colombia at the top of South America. Uh, main airport uh, outside of Panama City is Tucumán. Uh, it's a really easy flight from the U.S. with nonstop connections on um, with nonstop service on United or Copa uh, from a number of different gateway cities. So it makes it ideal for a short, long weekend trip, um, a lengthier trip at that. It has it has it all. It has culture, history, nature, amazing birding, incredible water sports, um, and it really can be conceived as a year-round destination, depending on what your clients are looking for. I'll I'll go into the seasonality of Panama a little bit later, um, but you'll see that Panama really is oriented to the east and west, uh, and this makes for some you know some interesting fun facts, if you will. Uh, you can dive both oceans, the Atlantic and Pacific, in one day. Uh, and there's certain points in the country where you can stand and the sun will actually be rising over the Pacific and setting over the Atlantic. Um, so it's very easy to get around. Uh, really good infrastructure in terms of roads, uh, flights. Panama City is often surprising for people that how modern it is. It feels like Miami. Um, but Panama has largely flown under the radar for, um, for high-end experiential, you know, small group or private tourism, uh, in part because for so long the government was very focused on promoting the canal, promoting trade, the financial sector, um, banking, tourism that was really focused only in the cities and sort of these larger uh, international chain hotels. Um, that has changed uh, pretty recently uh, for a couple of reasons. But while maybe for the type of travel and tourism we all like to support Panama has been under the radar, um, it's really, it's, ge it's geographical location has made it a, um, a, a global crossroads for, um, for a long time. And it's played a very central role in human history as a result. Um, there is evidence, archeological evidence throughout Panama that it was a center of, uh, of trade and religious ceremonies for pre-Columbian indigenous groups. Uh, of course, the Spanish came to Panama, crossed the isthmus, built their ships on the Pacific side, and really used Panama as their launching point for their campaign along the Pacific to overthrow the Incan Empire. Uh, and more recently, you had um, France, the US, and then of course, um, you know, labor from all over the world come to Panama and build the canal. 
So it's been a, a cultural melting point for a really long time. And you see that uh, in its, in uh, the, the architecture uh, in Panama City. Uh, in the old quarter, you have French influence, you have Spanish influence, you have Baroque style architecture. You see that in the national dress, uh, the Congo Poyera. Uh, is or the Poyera is very very Spanish and European feel. Um, along the Caribbean coast, you have more of an African influence, and this translates into really fun and interesting music, fabulous dieting, really cutting edge art um, that really I think stand out in Panama compared to some of its neighbors. Uh, people always ask like, why would I go to Panama instead of Costa Rica? Uh, aren't they aren't they the same? And there are a couple ways to answer this question. One is that a lot of the nature, um, kind of the, the ecotourism appeal, uh, does cross that border from Costa Rica into Panama. You have incredible birding, you have lush cloud forests, you have really dense rainforests, you have a great coffee culture, you have beautiful beaches. Um, but what Panama has that Costa Rica doesn't is this aspect of this human history. Um, you have, a, it's a melting pot for indigenous cultures. Panama has seven unique indigenous cultures. Um, the Gunayala are the women you see in the bottom right. Uh, they make the beautiful embroidered molas that you can see in Panama City um, for sale. Uh, they're always dressed in their indigenous garb and they live in the San Blas Islands. Uh, and then the Embera communities, that was the woman that was on that, that first slide on the left, are really well known for their intricate beadwork and their basket weaving. Um, you have this juxtaposition of ancient and modern history. Panama City celebrated its 500th anniversary uh, in, of its founding last August. Um, and then also compared to Costa Rica, in, in this era of social distancing, I think this is an important thing to point out, is you have fewer tourists. Uh, there's, it's pretty easy once you get outside of Panama City and the canal zone to, to get away from it all. Um, Isla Palenque is featured in the top right. We'll visit that later. It's a 400 acre private island, only eight, um, there's my neighbor's landscaping, sorry about that. <laughs> only eight small individual casitas and one uh, six bedroom villa that's great for private takeovers from families. Um, so talking about I'll be talking a little bit about um, COVID-19 and Panama and what our properties are doing as we go along in this. Um, monthly, another question we get all the time is like, when is the best time to visit Panama? Is it true that I can only travel like, you know, December, January, February, when it's, when it's the driest? Uh, that is not true. Like Costa Rica, Panama is a, is a country of a lot of different microclimates. So depending on where you go within the country, there's almost always a time of an area that has ideal weather a certain time of year. So this, I like this chart that I created simply because I think it's a good comparison with the three things that clients are almost always looking for. It's like how much rain is there, um, how crowded it is, is it, and what is the cost? Uh, for clients who want some, who are okay with like slightly damper weather and having that flexibility, to travel, I think the sweet spot for Panama and also crossing into Costa Rica is often this June, July, and August period. Um, it's when you have a lot of wildlife migrations happening as well. Humpback whales arrive in Panama, you have a lot of turtles hatching. Uh, costs are pretty low with the green season rates and then and crowds are, are quite small compared to the December and January high season. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, you definitely can visit these destinations or this country year round, um, just depending on what you're interested in and looking for. Um, so to provide you with an update on Panama's response to COVID-19, um, where the country's at, what has happened. Uh, first, I am not Panamanian, and so I've relied on a lot of close friends that are, are DMCs in Panama, also getting a lot of information from the Council of the Americas and America's Quarterly, which is a Wall Street Journal or economist style publication that focuses on like economics, health, um, and social issues throughout the Americas. Uh, Panama had its first recorded case on March 9th, uh, but they were ready for it. They had started, they had a plan in place uh, as of Super Bowl Sunday for how to combat COVID-19. Uh, so they very, very rapidly de uh, declared a state of emergency and had really robust and swift action uh, that shut the country down, that closed the borders. 
um, but uh, has, has been viewed pretty positively from within Panama. Um, they started testing very aggressively. They've been very transparent with their reporting um, and their national quarantine measures, which you know seem quite draconian to us in the US, uh, they really became a model that were adopted by other countries, uh, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia also took on, took on this, um, I don't want to call it house arrest, but keeping people indoors and only allowing uh, people to come outside for two hours at a time on set days of the week that were defined by, um, by your sex and your ID. Uh, they banned all um, out of the house activity over the Easter holiday, which is a really popular gathering time in Latin America. They banned all alcohol sales since alcohol tends to go hand in hand with big group gatherings. Um, I checked in yesterday with Diosa, uh, who is the director of sales for El Torolado, and also Jonathan Zalker from Truly Panama. My understanding is that these measures, this sort of lockdown measures, extended throughout May. It may start to lift in June, um, but I don't want to speculate and play. I don't know, astrologer onto what could happen when the country will open up again. We really don't know. Uh, it depends on quarantine measures that the government wants to take for people coming into the country and also a lot on airlift, um, but we don't have those answers right now. Um, but I think there's a lot of positivity in how uh, Panama has responded to this crisis uh, for a country of 4 million people. Uh, they've done a really great job of, uh, I think, just putting together a plan and then acting on it. Um, they've become a leader in, in the Caribbean and Latin America for how to combat COVID. And the United Nations and World Health Organization has designated Panama City specifically as this humanitarian hub um, and using their logistical expertise in moving goods. So they've become the center of distribution for PPE, um, for aid for a lot of the Caribbean and the Americas. Certainly like any country, um, Panama has its challenges and issues. Um, the president, Laurentino Cortizo, has not backed down from this. Uh, some of the criticism has been, Panama has been very quick to react and respond to this challenge. Why can't they address some of the, like, the really huge income uh, disparity and this inequality in the country's socio um, and, and economic issues? And he has said, this is an opportunity to rethink what we're doing. Um, how we can kind of equalize wealth distribution a little bit better, get resources to remote communities that need them. Uh, so I'm optimistic that Panama is going to emerge stronger from this. Uh, it might just take a little bit of time for tourism to get up and running again. So a quick orientation of the country. Uh, as I said, it's this meeting point between the North and South. Costa Rica and Colombia on one side, you have the Caribbean or the Atlantic side on one part of the country, Pacific Ocean providing the other border. Uh, Panama City is kind of right in the center. The canal runs across the country and you can get from one side to the other in about 90 minutes to two hours by car, depending on traffic. Uh, other populators, uh, popular ways to connect uh, the Panama City with the Caribbean would be Maybe a private helicopter charter is going to become even more appealing, uh, a partial transit of the canal. There's also a really fun uh, railway, the Panama Canal Railway. It's a very inexpensive way to get from one end to the other. They have glass observation cars. You're down on the water running along the ships. Uh, it remains to be seen when that will be up and running, but that's also a fun option for guests and families if they're going to go over to the Caribbean side and check out the property we work with, which is El Trolado. I'm going to show you a quick video that kind of encapsulates the magic of, of Puerto Bello and this, and this area that El Trolado is in.
Lotto is a small family owned property that sits tucked away uh, in Bahia de Portobello, which is this beautiful deep natural harbor uh, that the Spanish, when they first encountered it uh, more than 500 years ago, thought this is a really great place to, um, for, for trade where we can safely anchor our ships, we can build fortifications all around the harbor and what the Spanish did is after they, they crossed the isthmus, they um, you know, took down the Inca empire, they were bringing the gold and silver back through Panama. All of that wealth came through Portobello, through the customs house, which is now a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, and they would load up their galleons and send them back across the Pacific to Spain, all right here. Um, El Otro Lado is this small, um, this small collection of houses that you can see on the other part of the bay. It's only about a seven to 10 minute boat ride to get from one end to the other, surrounded by lush natural rainforests. And then you have beaches in the beautiful Caribbean just around here. Uh, you have mangroves and rivers back here. And then throughout the, um, throughout ringing the bay, you have fortifications dating back from the Spanish period uh, that they used to protect themselves against piracy. Um, it's rumored that Sir Francis Drake may be buried at sea over here. Um, Captain Henry Morgan came through Portobello, marched across the Isthmus to Panama, burnt it down. So the true history and stories of the pirates of the Caribbean um, still exist as legends and myth here. So that's a really fun angle to take if you're coming here exploring with kids or with history buffs. This fort right here is adjacent to the property. This is maybe a, a 15 minute power walk up the hill from where you'd stay at El Trolado. Um, and the other, uh, in addition to the wealth that was, uh, the, the monetary wealth that was being moved back and forth here, Portobello was sadly, it was a, a major slave trade port um, for the Americas where the Spanish would bring over enslaved Africans from different areas, particularly in West Africa. Um, and then uh, auction and sell people to use for uh, enslaved labor in the new world. Um, what you have that's unique in Portobello is the group that lives there today, the culture there today, they call themselves the Congos, and that is in reference to their history. Uh, since you had all of these different groups from Africa that didn't have a common language, um, living together in Panama, they developed their own language that preserved their religion their, um, you know, their essence of being mocked the Spanish and allowed them to communicate together. Eventually, several of these groups um, revolted against the Spanish and by pitching, um, pitching pirates and Spanish against each other, they were able to earn their freedom and establish free, the first free black communities in the new world uh, that were known as the Cimarrones. So the people in Portobello today, they call themselves Congos and they're very proud of their history from West Africa they celebrate it through music, through art. Um, there's wonderful festivals that are, have a carnival-like atmosphere that happen just after Easter. Uh, so this really rich and vibrant society is what, what exists in Portobello. And three, the story of El Trolado kind of centers on three women. Uh, their discovery of, of the magic that exists in Portobello, the love they felt for the people and for their culture, and their desire, uh, their desire to help these communities. Uh, as I said earlier, Panama, uh, like a lot of Central America, there is, um, there is quite a lot of wealth and inequality, uh, wealth inequality between the Caribbean and the Pacific sides, where you tend to have more of the larger cities. Um, Caribbean coasts are often indigenous or um, uh, communities of people from other Caribbean islands, West Indies, African descent. Uh, and they don't have access to the same medical, educational resources, um, infrastructure that communities on the Pacific do. So the women you see at the bottom, um, they're all related. On the right, you have, bottom right is Alejandra Fierro-Aleta. She's actually the world's largest collector of, of Afro-Latin um, Afro music. Latin music, she has an amazing record collection in Spain. I don't know how many albums she has. But she founded and runs the radio program. Um, her pseudonym is Gladys Palmera. So Radio Gladys Palmera is an awesome uh, playlist to follow on Spotify. Uh, and she, so her passion is music. Her sister is the woman all the way on the bottom left. That's Aurora Fiera Aleta. 
She is the owner of El Torlado. Her passion is really art and design and hospitality, which you will see if you ever go to the property. And then in the middle, the woman wearing the longer gown, that's their cousin, Sandra Aleta. Uh, she's a photographer. She's probably Panama's best known photographer. One of the best known female photographers in Central America uh, has had her work displayed all over the world. But a lot of her inspiration came from capturing images of the people of Portobello, where she ended up building a house and living for part of the year. And the three of them, their first goal was to set up this uh, Bahia de Portobello Foundation to help the local communities. Uh, the radio is Radio Gladys Palmera. I'm gonna follow up um, with uh, some fun playlists and links for everyone, so I'll, I'll get to that at the end. But Bahia de Portobello Foundation um, was set up with the goal of helping, enabling the people of Portobello to showcase their talents with the world their beautiful artistry, this seemingly innate ability to pick up an instrument and play like you're a virtuoso, um, their cultural heritage through dance and art, but also there's an economic component to it, of course, um, which uh, is, is based in, in hospitality with the Hotel El Trolado. Casa Congo is a, a series of smaller hotels in the town itself. They're like more like two to three star. And then they also run a restaurant which serves as a hospitality training school for uh, local people who want to go work at El Trilado. And then also, you know, the, the ultimate goal is to protect and share this, uh, this unique Congo heritage. Um, so the foundation enables certain senior artists and performers and storytellers to make their living as being uh, custodians of uh, Congo culture. On the left, you'll see Mama Eri. She's kind of like the unofficial, uh, uh, matriarch of the town. She's not the elected mayor, but everyone goes to her with their problems and concerns. And she actually will lead your guests on walking tours of the town, explaining the significance of, of different aspects of, of the local people's life. Uh, and then you have the hotel, El Trilado, uh, which is, while it was originally built as a private home for, uh, for Aurora Aleta's family, their escape from Panama City, Eventually, 10, I think it was 10 years ago now, she turned it into a hotel as part of this sort of nonprofit economic um, opportunity, uh, a way for people within the town of Portobello to not have to go to Panama City to be able to stay there, get a training in hospitality, work at the hotel, and make a great living for their family. Um, so the, the hotel is, is the heart of it is really based in this, uh, this larger community project. Uh, just some quick facts about it, 90 minutes by car from Panama City. Uh, you can do nothing there and be completely happy poolside reading a book. You can go bushwhacking for you know, up to like seven hours through the rainforest. It's a great area for fishing, for snorkeling. Uh, there's a number of diving options in the Caribbean, particularly with shipwrecks uh, that clients who dive can go to. The cultural heritage, the music and the art is a huge attraction. Rates are basically, there. there's two options. There's a and b option and all-inclusive. I don't want to get into the nitty details of this that you can read in the rate sheet I'm going to send or you can reach out to me when you have clients. I more want to like tell the story and the magic of this place because it is absolutely captivating. Um, when you arrive in Portobello town, you're met by boat. It's about a seven minute boat ride across the bay. Um, it's really interesting on a clear day, you can actually see the Caribbean terminus of the Panama Canal and the container ships lining up in the distance, waiting, waiting their turn to transit. Um, a lot of the, the, the hub of activity is in this gazebo restaurant. This is where you have the main restaurant, the bar, it's adjacent to the pool. Uh, like everything at El Trilado, it is a, uh, a conglomeration of the eclectic taste and design of El Trilado's owner, art and artifacts she's picked up on her travels throughout the world, but especially focused on this unique art, um, which often is based on carving and then painting carved wood uh, that is produced by the artisans and, and the master carvers that live in Portobello. There's a wood workshop on property. I don't wanna give a specific number, but I think they employ more than, more than 20 local artisans that craft and hand carve all of the furniture you have on property. Um, all of that's also available for sale to your clients through a gallery that's in town. Um, and again, going back to things that, you know, trends we might see post COVID-19, people looking to get away from it all, um, stay in smaller properties that are connected to nature, that
that have a strong connection with the community. El Otrolado already checks all of these boxes. Um, there's five houses. Three of them are one bedroom units. That would be great for a couple or maybe a couple with a very young child. Beautifully appointed ensuite bathrooms. Some of them have small kitchenettes. All of them have large balconies that face the pool um, or the harbor and they're surrounded by the rainforest. Uh, the spirit house is a two bedroom option. This is right waterfront. Um, important to note, this is not a beachfront property, but it is waterfront. We'll get to the beaches later. You can see here how close it is to that fort we saw earlier. But Spirit House is just magical. It has these two separate bedrooms with ensuite bathrooms, great for two couples traveling together or a family of four or, or five if the children are young. And then this great shared, um, shared kitchen and, and balcony. Uh, and then higher up on the property at the highest point, you have Casa Grande. Uh, this was uh, Aurora's original house that she had built to herself. And she had it built in the same architectural style as the customs house, which is in, um, which is in Portobello, with these huge pillars and, and two stories with wraparound balconies. I really like this option as a private buyout for families. There's three ensuite bedrooms upstairs. Two of them have loft rooms um, on a second smaller story. So they're great for families with young children that want that separation and privacy, but they don't want the kids to be in a completely separate room. Uh, the downstairs has gorgeous indoor outdoor living spaces and it has a full separate kitchen. So this has been really popular as a, as a completely kosher option for takeovers. Um, and then you have access to all of the same amenities that guests staying in the casitas in the individual houses down by the water do. Um, you just have more privacy and you have this huge beautiful balcony with hammocks, great place to read a book in the afternoon. Uh, especially if it's starting to rain or just like go out in the morning with your coffee and watch the jungle wake up. This is just an example of one of the bedrooms inside. There's three of these. Each of them is slightly different. Um, this can be bought out privately for a group of up to 10 people. So really great for your slightly larger um, multi-generational families. The property itself also makes um, a wonderful takeover, complete buyout option for maybe families who want to uh, celebrate a special birthday very easy to get to coming from the US. You know, if you're in Houston or a major gateway, it's a four hour flight and then you land and it's a 90 minute drive and where you're where you might be for the, the next four or five days. Um, like I, so, I was saying in that first picture that showed the entire bay, you're really well positioned here to uh, do deep explorations of the rainforest, of the water, of the historical sites, um, take a deep dive into the, the art and, and musical culture of the Congo people. Um, a lot of these experiences are included in the rate, hikes up to the fort, guided hikes through the rainforest, um, morning meditative experiences. There's three beaches that are accessible by boat. Um, at one of them, El Trolado has set up a, a little private rustic beach club. They take guests there every day. This is not your developed, um, you know, rows and rows of lounge chairs. You actually feel really like you're in kind of a cool, like shipwrecked pirate story where you're in this beautiful cove surrounded by reefs on either side. You can see how blue the water is, but the lack of development, I think, is what makes it so magical. If you're feeling ambitious, too, you can actually paddleboard to this beach. It's at about an hour from the property. This is an aerial view of it, but it's, it's included in the rate. Um, it's just especially fun for kids because they'll bring the kayaks, the stand-up paddle boards, the snorkel masks, and you can easily spend all day here um, just kind of playing and exploring in the forest where the forest meets the sea. Um, also a number of water sports. Some of these are available occluded in the rate, some are not. Pretty awesome to go wakeboarding um, in, the, in the bay beneath the, these ancient fortifications. Uh, the, this is actually Clark's son uh, down in the bottom right here. Of course, he probably got off his first try. You can go snorkeling, you can go deep sea fishing with locals. Um, and then on property, they have a number of activities. They have uh, mojito making classes. They do a, a, a virgin version for kids. They have a yamarada class where it's how you try to make the hot sauce that this, uh, this one chef uh, that works at El Trilado, everyone knows her, she has great pink hair. It's kind of her signature dish. So she helps guests make their own to take home. Um, they do sunset boat rides through the mangroves for bird watching. And then there's all of the activities that are part of the um, Bahia Portobello Foundation. And this, I think, is really the sweet spot. 
um, for anyone going to El Trolado. Uh, the cultural experiences, the Congo dance performances are very popular, and these are regularly scheduled throughout the week. Um, so that if your guests are staying for two to three nights, they will definitely experience this at least once. Um, percussion workshops, these are run by the Little Rhythm School, which is a free school in Portobello, supports more than 100 local kids, and they have completely free musical education and a whole variety of instruments, including, um, including voice lessons. They have an all-student troupe, really, uh, wildly talented. They've performed for dignitaries, for Morgan Freeman when he's come to visit, for different UN envoys. Um, and they will, your kids or, or you, can go and take a percussion class for this little eight-year-old completely schooling you. Um, and then they've also, the, a part of the Little Rhythm School that I love, and this is actually funded by um, the woman who started Radio Gladys Palmera, she has a deal with UC Berkeley that in exchange for scholarships uh, for students from Portobello, she will eventually donate her record collection to UC Berkeley. And Mary in the upper right was the recipient of one of those. She studied, um, she studied bass for, I think, two semesters at UC Berkeley, returned to Portobello, and is now an instructor in the school after being a student. And one of her initiatives was to start a program for, um, for early, early childhood musical education. So it's a program for babies, I think toddlers to about two years old, where they just get to come and play and like have this really fun experience of, uh, yeah, trying out, trying out what instrument is for them. Uh, there's also the, uh, the wood shop on site. And if you're a guest at El Trilato, you can go to a, a sculpture workshop. Can't do the carving yourselves, but you can watch the masters at work and then you are able to paint uh, receive art lessons and how to make your own kind of Congo style canoe or paddle. Uh, and these are led by the same artists who create all of the like whimsical and magical masterpieces you see on the property. Um, and when your clients participate in any of these experiences, they're really giving back to the foundation um, and supporting these individuals being able to make their livelihood off their culture and their art. Uh, in terms of opening plans, COVID-19. Uh, we don't have anything firm from El Trilado yet. We checked in yesterday and since the, they're part of this larger community project, their efforts have largely been focused on making sure the needs of people in Portobello whose income was derived largely from tourism are being met in this time of no travel. Um, so they have, they've, they've started a a branch of the foundation is providing food and medical supplies and education for the local people. Um, but it's, it's been hard. So they did start a GoFundMe. Um, it's Portobello Solidario. I'm going to send out the link to it later if you're interested. It is Giving Tuesday today. So I felt that if, um, if you are so inclined to support this, if you have the means, you might be interested in, in helping the people of Portobello get what they need now to ensure that they're ready and able to um, to come back to work at El Trilado when, when travel happens again. But I'm gonna send that link later. Um, and again, when we have more concrete information on when El Trilado might open, what their plans and steps are, we'll certainly share that. But right now their efforts are 100% uh, focused on supporting the local communities. Uh, so going back to Panama as a whole, and now I'm gonna take you to the Pacific side. Uh, so from from Portobello over here, adjacent to Cologne, um, you would go back to Panama City. Most people are gonna drive and then fly to David. This is a small airport. It's served with four flights daily on Copa, connecting David with Panama City. Um, it has international airport capacity, but I don't, or abilities, I don't believe it's, um, it was receiving any international flights prior to this. Um, but David is a great area, is where you would access the, the Cherokee region from. Um, Cherokee is known for its coffee highlands, for Barrow Volcano, beautiful cloud forests, um, the little town of Boquete up here, which is really popular as an expat retirement community, but for good reason. It has amazing spring-like weather year-round, um, wonderful hiking through the mountains, um, great farms that are producing a lot of artisanal honey and cheeses and coffee. Um, or you can opt to go down to Cherokee's coast in the Gulf of Cherokee. Um, and this is where Isla Palenque is. It's uh, you, from David. It's a one hour drive to the port of Boca Chica. 
That is where Isla Palenque services commence. They pick your guests up in a boat and it's a 15 minute ride um, along the, through the islands of the Gulf of Chiriqui until you get to Isla Palenque. And Isla Palenque is a 400 acre private island. Uh, it's adjacent to a protected marine park that is the seasonal home to humpback, migrating humpback whales by the thousands, dolphins, rays, um, a number of deep sea sport fish, gropers, billfish, turtles. Um, so just this marine wonderland. And I think what's so special about Isla Palenque is the feeling that it gives you when you arrive. Um, you truly feel like Robinson Crusoe, uh, like you're an explorer, you're arriving at this island paradise uh, that exists completely in harmony in nature that hasn't been developed. Uh, you know, it's extremely comfortable, but the, the privacy of it and that um, leaving nature as it was found is, is really what makes it so special. It's certainly what attracted Isla Palenque's owner here. Uh, his, his name is Benjamin Loomis, and he was an architect in Chicago. Um, kind of got burnt out on the city life and the rat race and ran away to Panama, bought an island and lived in his hammock on the island for more than five years while he explored every bit of its like nooks and crannies, um, started Isla Palenque and then turned it over the, to the Cayuga collection to manage two years ago. Um, here you can see where it is just outside of the, the watery borders of the official um, Gulf of Chiriqui National Marine Park. Um, Isla Palenque is a sandy island. It has five miles of wonderful sandy beaches. So great for swimming, um, great for kids for playing. The best diving and snorkeling is gonna be further afield at some of these rockier islands, but it's really easy to do half and full day boat trips from Isla Palenque to this area. Um, as I was saying, you're coming here uh, because of the natural beauty. There's turtles, there's a, a troop of more than 50 howler monkeys on the island. They've identified, I think, upwards of 40 unique bird species um, on Isla Palenque, both shorebirds, migratory birds, resident hawks. So not, the, not like the Osa Peninsula uh, in terms of bird diversity, but, but great for, uh, for your average birder. They'd be very happy there. Of course, you have the humpback whales, which are there seasonally. Um, they usually arrive in late July, and they hang around till early November. They're giving birth to their young, so it's fantastic. And you know, in September and October, you can almost definitely see mothers and their calves um, you know, playing together offshore, right when you're having your cocktail at the bar in the evening as the sun is going down. Uh, and then Isla Palenque, going back to the archeological evidence of trade in Panama among pre-Columbian groups, there are open dig pits throughout the island um, that were once being investigated by the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute with pottery shards and stone tools, potentially dating back to 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, um, that are just open. And the guides, one of the walks, the secrets of the island tour is so cool. The guides take your clients on these hikes throughout the island to these pits, and you can like handle and manipulate and dream about what these objects were used for, that usually you'd only find them in a museum. Um, there's also guided paddle boarding excursions, kayaking, natural hikes, birding hikes throughout the island. Similar to El Trilado, it's an all-inclusive experience, um, starting with that round trip boat transfer to Boca Chica, um, to Isla Palenque. Your meals are included on island, uh, a selection of on-island and near-island tours, um, complimentary yoga, use of the steps and paddle boards. Whale season is, is I'd say, July through October. Uh, and it's very, very flexible. So I like it for larger family groups or for maybe two families traveling together because there are options to be uh, cohesive and intact and do every single activity together. But there's also, there's enough diversity on the island and the daily offerings of excursions that someone can go and do yoga in the morning. You know, the kids and maybe, maybe dad go and they go kayaking with one of the guides on this little like cave exploration where you find colonies of bats and little gemstones that have washed up from the ocean. Maybe someone else wants to go birding. Maybe somebody just wants to drink uh, you know, champagne in a hammock and not do anything. And that's all possible in Isla Palenque. Uh, overview of the island, the casitas, which were newly built at end of 2000, in 2018. These, uh, these are on Playa Palenque, which is more than one mile of sandy shoreline. It's this beautiful crescent strip of sand faces west so you get great sunsets. Uh, over here on Playa Primera, 
This is where we have the, uh, the six bedroom villa can uh, accommodate a family of up to 14. They don't rent those rooms out individually. It's only for a private takeover and they've had it rented by groups as small as two. So that's a really good option if you want the ultimate privacy, your own beach, your own house, uh, your own dedicated, um, kind of dedicated host that's on site with you, but access to all of the island amenities, um, over here is where you arrive if you're coming by boat from Boca Chica. And then you can see the trails throughout the island, the beaches you can kayak and stand up paddleboard to. Um, and then the, the snorkeling and, and diving locations are more like a, probably a 30 minute boat ride from, from Isla Palenque. Um, it has, has a wonderful restaurants, fabulous pool, uh, in-room massages are available what you would expect from, a, um, from a, a luxury island escape. But I think the, the really strong special sauce, if you will, of Isla Palenque is that seclusion and comfort, but within this beautiful natural immersion. Uh, the individual casitas, all of them have direct beach access. They're surrounded by their own grove of, uh, of palm trees and greenery, so you have a lot of privacy. You have the sandy front yard king beds in each, in, each, uh, in each casita with a sunken living room, air conditioning within, and then this indoor-outdoor living concept. Um, that's your path to the beach. And then each has a, an outdoor covered bathroom and then an outdoor soaking tub beneath the palms. Um, these can accommodate either a couple or a family with two to three young children using trundle uh, extra beds brought in. Um, but for larger groups, definitely the, the villa is the way to go. The villa has its own pool, has its own um, rancho outside with a little bar, has its own beach access. Uh, and the feedback we've had from so many families here is it's, it's just magical. It's one of their favorite vacations of their life. Probably because it gives them, as opposed to like a more developed beach resort with so many activities and uh, events every evening is this opportunity to really connect with each other, you know, kind of like we're all doing now. It, it forces you to slow down, um, to get on nature's time, and to, to have those great meaningful conversations and moments that you remember from vacation for the rest of your life. Uh, we have an excursion book that I, I'll send with follow-up that kind of lists all the different activities. Important to note that with Isla Palenque, a lot, um, they have huge tidal swings. So a lot of what you're able to do and the scheduling is based on the tides. Um, so my advice would be don't over-program yourself. If your clients want to go snorkeling one day, if they want to do the, um, you know, the romantic like private island escape for a day, let, let us know in advance. They'll set that up and then they'll program it according to when the, the ocean and conditions and the tides are best for those activities. Um, and then what is Isla Palenque doing right now about COVID-19? What, what are their plans moving forward? Um, as I mentioned before, Isla Palenque is part of the Cayuga collection. Uh, they manage properties in Nicaragua, Panama, and Costa Rica, uh, award-winning boutique luxury sustainable hotels. Several of them are part of um, the National Geographic Unique Lodges of the World collection. Um, and We've been, they've been very successful in having bookings rescheduled. Uh, over 85% of their, their clients have opted to reschedule and postpone their trips for the future. And uh, uniquely, if it was a direct advisor who had worked with Isla Palenque to reschedule a future booking, um, they're paying that commission now. Um, that's on, uh, you know, their hours of staff have been reduced, so I know they're still working through commissions to pay. But if you were an advisor who booked clients at any of the Cayuga hotels and they were able to postpone, if you book directly, they're, um, they're taking care of your commission now. They understand how important that is. Uh, they also adopted this zero risk, zero hassle booking policy. That's in effect now through December 21st, 2020, which is when um, festive season kicks off. And essentially there's, there's no deposit required. Uh, there's no cancellation penalties. They just want to do all they can to assure people that like their investment in travel, um, if something happens and they're not able to travel because of COVID, they're not going to, to lose out on that investment. Um, they've extended this season's rates to next season. So 2020, 2021 rates are now extended through the end of high season, um, 2021, 2022. They've adjusted all of their payment and cancellation policies. They've essentially cut them in half. 
Um, so now you don't have to prepay until, and this is for, this applies to next year. This is not to this, this current season, um, but they've adjusted it down to a 15 day prior for green season, 30 day prior prepayment for high season, and then 60 days for festive peak dates. Um, they're rolling out a, a whole manifesto on guest health and safety. I was talking to Cayuga's co-owner and founder Hans Fister this morning, and he's, you know, they're, they're really following what a lot of these larger international chains like Hilton and Marriott are doing for guest safety. They want to take those same kind of measures, but make them very appropriate for a tropical setting. Um, it's not, nobody wants to arrive at this like almost deserted tropical island and have check-in be done through a plexiglass shield. Um, but so that's going to be coming out really soon. They're very on top of getting these policies in order. And then I have absolutely loved working with Hans and the Cayuga collection throughout this whole process. Um, they've been incredibly transparent in, in their policies, in, in what they're doing now, how hard this has been for staff, why they're optimistic about the future, and they've been sharing their best practices in a lot of blogs and through talks Hans has been giving with other DMCs and hotel partners to try to get them all on the same page. Um, and looking for ways to come out of this stronger, you know, thinking about their values, thinking about their commitment to the environments and local communities. So I'm going to be following up with um, links to some of his blogs that have been widely shared and I think appreciated within the tourism industry. Uh, that's it for today that I have on Panama. Um, and I'm going to, let's see what questions we have. I think there were some, some good Q&A discussions.